I reckon that's pretty good. Now for a long time I wanted to have some sort of lifting aid to help me open the bonnet, which in my case is very heavy with a spare wheel on top. But I've never really found a practical solution for this. However, last year on another YouTube channel, I thought I considered to be a viable solution. Now before we go any further, do we even need a gas trap, a gas ram? I've seen various videos on the internet and people have fitted them to standard bonnets. But I don't see the point. The bonnet itself weighs about 25 kilos. You only need a force of 12 kilos to lift it at the front. And to me, well, it's just a bit of a party trick. On the other hand, we've got a spare wheel on the bonnet. It's quite a different matter. It needs a hell of a force to lift it, but also it's a safety issue. You've got to hold the bonnet with one hand and manoeuvre the strut into place with the other. And if it slips for any reason, it's going to come crashing down and you'll do yourself a serious injury. So there a gas ram has real purpose. And the next point, where to mount the gas ram? Now I've seen kits being marketed and the bottom of the ram goes somewhere along here on the top of the wing and the top of the ram goes somewhere along here on the edge of the bonnet and there are two problems with that. Firstly, if you mount it like that, the push from the ram is mainly horizontal and you would need an enormous force to lift the bonnet with a spare wheel. And secondly, there's no strength here on the edge of the bonnet. Clearly these kits have not been designed by engineers. What you need to do is you need to get the bottom of the ram as low as possible inside the engine bay. And the top of the ram needs to go to uh, this reinforcing structure here. And if you do that, you've got a chance. But the key bits of information you need are what's the close length of the strut, what's the open length, and what force is required. And I'll show you how to calculate this. Now the first step is to establish the geometry. And to do this, well the easiest way is to set up a coordinate system and measure everything with respect to that. So I'm going to have my origin here at this point, which is directly above where the lower support point is going to be. And I'm going to have my x-axis along there, y-axis going backwards and z-axis in the vertical direction. And I measure all of the key dimensions against this, and in particular the position of the hinges, lower position of the support, the upper position of the support when the bonnet's in the closed position, and of course all of the bonnet key dimensions. Firstly I tabulate the coordinates of the key points. Then I make a little 2D sketch of the bonnet. I now calculate the moment about the hinge of the weight of the bonnet and the spare tire in both the closed and open position. Finally, I calculate the position of the top end of the strut in the YZ plane when the bonnet is open by theta degrees using a bit of trigonometry. Now that we've got the geometry established, we need to calculate the length of the strut in both the bonnet open and bonnet closed positions. And given that it's in three dimensions, by far the easiest way to do this is with vector algebra. And finally, we need to calculate the force required in the strut to resist the moment caused by the weight of the bonnet and tire in both the closed and open positions. And again, this is a standard problem in vectors. So I coded this up and the model is shown here in a tree form. And it gives us some useful results, such as the closed length of the strut, the open length, the required extension, the required force to lift the bonnet when it's in the closed position and the required force to keep the bonnet open when it's raised. And this is sufficient information to enable us to choose a strut. So I did the analysis, selected a strut, this one here, and I fitted it. I didn't pay too much attention to the end fittings and I basically just 
copied what the other guy, Benjamin uh, Mikalev, had done. And that meant fitting the ball joint like this. And when I put the bonnet down, in fact, what happened was this flipped around, it overstressed itself and it broke the end off the strut. Not good. I'm afraid to say it meant I had to start looking at the angles and the tolerances in rather more detail. Now, looking at the hardware, we've got a right angle ball joint here, obviously designed to operate within the working range, but actually it's not that great. It only goes about plus or minus 20 degrees. And if we look at a typical 50 kilogram strut, the end portion is threaded at M8, which is really not very strong. And so if this goes out of range and starts putting bending into the arm here, you're going to have a failure. We now need to talk about the design of the upper bracket. Now I've got an angle bracket here to which the ball joint is bolted and we need to decide what the direction this needs to be to ensure that the ball joint is always operating within its working range. Now, the angle of this plane here is defined by the direction, the outward normal, and this points in the direction, the local x-axis, um, which means that the azimuth angle is zero. Now, we know that the lower end of the strut is going to be anchored more or less beneath me here, which corresponds to somewhere around this point here. So my best guess is that we need to angle the, this bracket here more or less in this direction and that would correspond to an azimuth angle of minus 45 degrees in my coordinate system and let's see if that's supported by the maths we need to calculate the angle between the strut and the fixed stems of the two ball, ball joints and recall that the angle needs to be as close to 90 degrees as possible say in the range 70 to 110 degrees and we've got an excellent start here because we already know the direction vector for the bonnet strut which we use in the initial design now calculating the angle between two vectors is a standard problem i'm not going to try to explain how it's done but there are some excellent videos out there on youtube which may be of interest to the more technically minded viewer now, at the bottom, it's fairly straightforward because the ball joint is fixed. If, for example, we bolt the stem to the side member, the stem will be parallel to the X direction. And if we use a right angle bracket, we can make it parallel to the Y direction. However, at the upper end, it's rather more complicated because the angle will depend both on the bonnet opening angle and the azimuth angle of the bracket itself. And the way to deal with this is through the use of rotation matrices. And these are widely used in various branches of engineering, for example, aeronautical engineering and in robotics. And again, I'm not going to try to explain how it's done. There are excellent videos out there. The result of the calculation for the lower ball joint, again in tree format, and I consider two cases when the bonnet's closed and when the bonnet is open. And this is the direction of the support of the ball joint. And this means that the fixed stem is pointing in the X direction. And we see that the angle between the strut and the ball joint, in this case, it's 58 degrees. And when the bonnet's open, it's just over 70 degrees. And bearing in mind that this needs to be in the range 70 to 110 degrees, this is not an acceptable solution, so we have to do something about it. We now look at the upper bracket, and if you recall, the relative angle between the strut and the ball joint depends very much on the azimuth angle of the bracket. So I've decided to plot this in graphical form where we are varying the azimuth angle. Now for the case of the body to open, I guess that the ideal solution where we've got a relative angle of 90 degrees would occur at an azimuth angle of minus 45 degrees. In fact, we achieved this at minus 50 degrees, so not a bad guess. And this position doesn't change much looking at the case of the closed bonnet. 
In response to the results of the analysis, I had to rotate the ball joint more in line with the incoming strut. I did this by making up a wedge mounting, in this case by cutting a big nut in half. Crude but effective. At the upper end, I did indeed find that by rotating the bracket to the calculated azimuth angle, the ball joint is very close to the optimum operating angle of 90 degrees. Regarding the original failure, where the bracket rotated under the eccentric loading from the incoming strut, I could of course fix the bracket with a small weld. On the other hand, by putting the ball joint on the inside of the bracket, the eccentric loading disappears and the whole thing becomes stable. And this is what I did. Well, there's not a whole lot more to say. This works very much as designed. Very boring. Obviously, if I take the spare wheel off, the gas strut's going to be a little bit strong. So I would disconnect it and I'd go back to using the standard bonnet strut. It's easy to disconnect, no problem. Now, this strut is 400 millimetres long by 50 kilogram force. That won't be right for everyone, and that isn't a recommendation. If I want the bonnet to open a bit wider, I'd have to go for a longer strut. That would mean connecting it further back, otherwise it's not going, the bonnet's not going to close. And that would mean recalculating both the geometry and the force. But overall, I'm very happy with it.